November 26, 2019, and we're going to get to the eclipse because we're building up to it. They are not the ringmaster, says the Lord. They are indeed the fools and the clowns in a very convoluted charade that has been put on display to open the eyes wide of the people and yanking up by the root for all to see the true motivation of these false excavations that the enemy's agents have taken part in a witch hunt where they shall now become the hunted for dare attempting to hunt my children down and take them down, says the Lord of hosts. How dare they? The hunter shall now become the hunted and the hunted are moving on and soaring to glory and shall be above and not beneath. September 14th, 2020. The hunt is on, says the Lord. The hunt is on. The hunter shall suddenly switch in the blink of an eye and become the hunted. For I, the Lord God, am reversing the current. I am reversing the current. For many are attempting to create a current that runs opposing Almighty God, that opposes the people of God, a raging river of a current. Rage being the key word, my children. April 24th, 2023. The hunters shall become the hunted. This includes those who hunted down JFK and, and, and JFK Jr., those family lines that participated in that. That was interesting. That I found and I put in there. April 7th, 2023. The persecuting spirit has been sent forth with force to intimidate the people through the events unfolding in your nation. Those who grin at such, what a sad, pathetic group, says the Lord. They shall find themselves flat on their backs. Those grins will not last for long as they think they have hunted down prey. The hunter shall become the hunted. This will echo in this season once again. It has gone forth, however. The hunters have set themselves up to become prey, for they shall be hunted down by their own agendas, by their own accusations, by their own weapons of destruction, that they shall lose control of these beasts and they shall become the hunted for what they have done. The enemy counterfeits what is of God. This is what he does. Four faces of the living creatures in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, enemy uses four strategies, which has four different faces or phases against you, which is at work in this nation. One of those faces was the lion, correct? And we have in Second Peter, the scripture, the enemy roams about like a lion seeking whom he may devour. So the enemy takes those aspects and he tries to counterfeit it, okay, or destroy it. Now, Hosea chapter 9, verses 8 through 11, coincides with this. Do not rejoice, O Israel, with exultation, as do the pagan peoples, for you have played the prostitute, turning away from your God. You have loved prostitutes' earnings on every threshing floor. And it says in parentheses, attributing the harvest to the bales instead of to God. Ephraim was a watchman with my God, a true prophet to warn the nation. That's in parentheses. But the snare, now listen to this. But the snare of a bird catcher was laid in all his paths. And there is only deep hostility in the house of his God. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. The Lord will remember their wickedness and guilt. He will punish their sins. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe fruit on the fig tree in its first season. But they came to Baal Peor and consecrated themselves to shamefulness. And they became as detestable and loathsome as the thing they loved. As for Ephraim, their glory will fly away like a bird. No birth. No pregnancy. This is a war. Now, listen, this is going to come up later on in the eclipse. No birth, no pregnancy, and no conception. That glory will depart like an eagle if it's allowed to. Okay, that's what I wrote after this. The glory will depart like an eagle if it's allowed to. We don't have to allow it to. We don't have to allow the glory of God to completely depart and lift from this nation and this entire nation to completely fall. The meaning of Baal Peor is Lord or owner of the opening. Definition of opening is an aperture or gap, especially one allowing access. So the meaning is Lord or owner who allows access, which exactly what Bale does. He gains access and then he opens the access up, right? This is what demons do, opens the access up and allures the people in to enslave them. Now, a word for the prophetic office in this season. It's going to get deep. Those 
that are that I'm going to go on about this later on. But those that are waiting around in the shallow end, that's where they're going to remain because this is going to get deep. Ezekiel chapter two, verses one through ten. He said to me, son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. Then as he spoke to me, the spirit entered me and sat on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, I am sending you, son of man, to the children of Israel, to a rebellious people that have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have sinned and revolted against me to this very day. Verse four, I am sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children. And you shall say to them, thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, as for them, whether they listen or refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know and be fully aware of the fact that there has been a prophet among them. And you, son of man, neither fear them nor fear their words through briars and thorns, though briars and thorns are all around you and you sit amongst scorpions, neither fear their words nor be dismayed at their presence, for they are a rebellious house. But you shall speak my words to them, whether they will listen or refuse, for they are are rebellious. Verse eight, as for you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I am giving you. Then I looked and I saw a hand stretched out toward me and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me and it was written on the front and on the back and written on it were words of, that's in parentheses, lamentation, which are funeral songs and mourning and woe. Eat the scroll God has given you and speak forth that book with courage and authority for the Lord thy God has given it to you. And in spite of what others may say, you shall speak it forth and the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. That is part of that word also after Ezekiel um, for those that truly hold the prophetic office. There is the gift of prophecy, which everyone can have that gift if they desire it, they can earnestly seek it. And then there's the office. That word is for the office because the Lord has given scrolls out. He is, and they're deep. And we are to take them in and we are to speak it in spite of what others say. We are to speak it. Ezekiel chapter three, verses one through 10. He said to me, son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll, then go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me the scroll. He said to me, son of man, eat this scroll that I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. Verse four, then he said to me, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. For you are not being sent to a people of unintelligible speech or difficult language, but to the house of Israel. Not too many peoples of unintellig unintelligible speech or difficult language whose words you cannot understand. But I have sent you to them who should listen to you and pay attention to my message. Yet the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you and obey you since they are not willing to listen to me and obey me. For the entire house of Israel is stubborn and obstinate. Behold, I have made your face as hard as their faces and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. I have made your forehead like emery, which is a diamond, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or be dismayed before them, though they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, receive into your heart all my words, which I will speak to you and hear with your ears. Okay. Ezekiel chapter three, verse 17. Son of man, I have appointed you as a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. Here comes the warning. Here it is. What, what's being spoken here, that's part of it. Now, interestingly enough, there is, now I want to make sure that I have this here it is. Okay, I'm going to read to you a prophetic word from November 26, 2019, and I'm going to read to you something from Ezekiel chapter 1, and you're going to see the correlation. I, the Lord, hand a very holy torch to my anointed, and they shall miraculously carry it to the nations. Now, remember the word torch. Include, um, they shall miraculously carry it to the nations including the United States for so much has been introduced that have pulled people away from me, says the Lord. And I, the Lord, am claiming these territories and regions and disabling the strongholds of the demon princes who rule at the gate, says the Lord. They shall have no power, says the Lord. I am miraculously disabling it and the evidence shall come forth in the natural strange happening shall manifest that shall be assigned to my people. I, the Lord God, Jehovah, am taking back from the enemy what he unrightfully and unlawfully stole from my kingdom, and now he shall answer those charges, and demon princes will be sent in retreat back to the pits of hell from which they came, says the Lord God Jehovah in Jesus' name. Now, 
Ezekiel chapter one, verses 12 through 14. Listen, remember the word torch. And each went straight forward wherever the spirit was about to go. They would go without turning as they went. Among the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches moving back and forth among the living beings beings the fire was bright and lightning was flashing from the fire and the living beams moved rapidly back and forth like flashes of lightning wherever the spirit would go they would go we must oh so this that this is what it says in this uh two i think it's two scriptures wherever the spirit would go they would go we must have this as our concern right now not pettiness no more feeding people sour milk and sour wine that comes from old wineskins. It is shallow, and that's capitalized. The shallowness shall be left to wade in the shallow end and shall not, that's capitalized, move forward into the deep. Shallow and sour is stunting the growth of the people, and the Lord is correcting and pruning such in this season. There shall be an eclipse in multiple ways. Now, this is where we get into the eclipse part. NASA images of three major eclipses that have and will pass over America between 2017 and the one in October came up, comes approximately two weeks after Yom Kippur. Passover in 2024 begins Monday, April 22nd, 2024, and ends at nightfall on Monday, the 29th of April, 2024. So this eclipse comes 14 days prior to Passover, which is seven days long, 14 is double sevens. These three eclipses are seven years apart. The 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Nun, N-U-N, which means deceit, kingship, fish, miscarriage, and miracle, which I find amazing. Another meaning for Nun, this is written by Rabbi Horowitz, is the same uh, is true of Joshua, Moses' successor. Wasn't Joshua the son of Nun? I got to look that up. I think I think that is it, but I'm going to double check. As some sources compare Moses to a fish, a nun, because he was taken out of the water by Pharaoh's daughter. So is Joshua called Ben Nun, the son or disciple of this great fish, Moses? The Torah does not inform us about this, his intellect, but rather that he was Moses' disciple, that he was always at Moses' side and in Moses' tent. Why did he merit inheriting the leadership of the Jewish people from Moses? Because he embraced the quality of humility with his entire being. Even before King David became king, he was known as, quote, the final verdict. Isn't it interesting if David was known as the final verdict uh, because he was chosen by God, that Hitler would introduce from the throne of Satan something called the final solution against uh, the people of God, the apple of his eye, because the enemy has to counterfeit what God tries to do. What God does, because he doesn't have to try very hard, what he does, the enemy then tries to come in and counterfeit. So King David was known as the final verdict. King Saul, his predecessor, was brilliant, but... The scriptural law was determined, now that's called the halacha, was determined according to David. We know that David was, was humble and he was called the servant of the Lord and my servant David and a man after God's own heart, even though David was an incredibly flawed man. So the leader who is coming must, and this is capitalized, show humility, embracing it instead of seeing it as a weakness because it actually before God is a strength. Now back to the eclipse because this all ties in. The Hebrew calendar is a lunar calendar with the months based on the phases of the moon. A new month begins on the day of the crescent moon after the new moon phase. This change is called the Rosh Chodesh, head of the of the new, okay, or head of the new moon. Each Rosh Chodesh is a minor holiday. Eclipses are mentioned multiple times in the Bible. When they are mentioned in the Bible, they mostly coincide with biblical milestones. Joel 3.15 the sun and moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. Amos 8, 9. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Matthew 27, 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. This is as Yeshua hung on the cross. Isaiah 13, 10. The stars of heaven in their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And then we have Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 through 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky so that darkness spreads over Egypt. 
darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. Now, isn't it interesting that darkness covered Egypt for three days? And the darkness was over the land when Christ died for three hours and Christ was in the darkness of the tomb for three days. So this is no uh, this is no coincidence. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. Yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Now, there was an interesting event that happened with an eclipse. And I'm going to tell you the two because they coincide to what we see going on right now in the United States of America. In the closing days of his life, Herod the Great, Herod was the one that tried to have Jesus killed as a child. He tried to, to totally destroy him. And he took a lot of life of a lot of children attempting to do this. In the closing days of his life, Herod the Great was presented with a crisis called the Golden Eagle Incident. The Golden Eagle Incident. Herod had placed a golden eagle over the entrance to the temple. Although he professed, professed that it was an offering dedicated to the Lord, it was regarded as a desecration of the temple by two rabbis, Matthias and Judas, who provoked a group of more than 40, interesting number, individuals into pulling down the eagle. Herod's soldiers captured and executed many of the participants. Matthias and Judas were burned alive. After relating this sordid incident, Josephus comments that the night after Matthias and Judas were executed, there was an eclipse of the moon. Now that's in the book of antiquities that this comes from. This is the only reference to a lunar eclipse in all the writings of Josephus. Perhaps a modern historian would not have mentioned it, judging that an astronomical event like an eclipse is independent of the activities of man, unless it preceded some important occasion such as a battle, and so influenced a decision such as whether or not to go to war. In the ancient world, however, an eclipse was regarded as an omen whenever it happened. For Josephus, the eclipse in the night after Herod put to death the two protesters and who were rabbis was a sign of displeasure from God. This is shown by the fact that Josephus describes immediately after the mention of the eclipse, Herod's physical suffering, a suffering from which he could find no relief until his death at some time between the eclipse and Passover. In the Antiqu Antiquities passage, the eclipse and Herod's torment signify the same thing. God's solemn judgment on Herod after he put to death individuals more righteous than himself. Okay. Herod, the leader, putting to death individuals way more righteous than he. I want you to think about that. I also want you to think about the fact that a golden statue resembling Ishtar was placed over the New York City courthouse where there is supposed to be the upholding of the law and true justice. This is no coincidence. There are two weeks between the eclipse, April 8th, 2024, and Passover 2024. Two weeks is between those events. It's going to be one of the most volatile and pivotal, probably, that up, which means crown or weapon. This is no coincidence. That seven months will be unprecedented in some ways, shocking, a time where those who choose to do as Herod will fall, the Trojan horse will be caught, and its hosts entrapped. A time of hard choices, deep necessary conflict for Israel for their own protection. Attempting to bind the people of the U.S. again, except that's capitalized. They are using an old dry brittle rope that shall fall apart by the pressure the Lord thy God shall apply. The pressure shall break establishments, alliances. Those quarreling now and backbiting as sheep shall work together. This shall be. And some will even be being delivered from the lion's den. And I have something that I'm going to talk about next week. A dream I had has to do with that. That we'll get into next week. Another famous eclipse, this time of the sun, may have played a part in the account of Jonah and the Ninevites. The time of Jonah's preaching in Nineveh can only be estimated generally from the Bible. Second Kings 14.25 says, says that Jeroboam II, who was king of Israel at that time, restored the northern and eastern borders of Israel according to the word of the Lord spoken by the prophet Jonah, son of Amittai. Jeroboam II began a corrigency with his father Jehoash in 793 or 92 BC and reigned alone from 81 BC to the late summer or early 
fall. So it would be from 782 to 753. Assuming that Jonah's prophecy of restoration came early in the reign of Jeroboam, Jonah's ministry would have been in the first half of the 8th century BC, from about 793 to 750 BC. During this time, the Assyrian eponym canon, which is what the Assyrians recorded things on, records an eclipse of the sun that occurred in the eponym of Bur Sagale in the month of Simenu. Okay. Modern astronomical calculations date this eclipse to June 15th, 17, uh, June 15th, 763 BC, and show it was a total eclipse as it passed near Nineveh. For historians, the importance of this eclipse is that it provided an absolute date that allowed assigning BC years to the yearly eponyms of the Assyrian canon. The accuracy of this Assyrian canon dates was later confirmed when new inscriptions were found and also when compared to the data derived. Okay, so they derived data from other canons and that data overlapped and matched. So the month of June, which has now now think about this, this eclipse near Nineveh in Jonah's time happens in the month of June, June 15th, 763 B.C. The month of June, which has by no coincidence become Pride Month. What was Jonah sent to do? To call on Nineveh to humble, that's capitalized, themselves before Almighty God to avoid total destruction from a fierce judgment that was about to come down on the whole nation. Nineveh happened to be the hub of worship of Ishtar, false goddess of fertility and divine law, also known as Ashtoreth to the Israelites. Those who served in her temple, the men would dress up as women and many considered themselves non-binary and practice homosexuality. Is it any coincidence the enemy chose the month of June as Pride Month when near that eclipse, Jonah marched into Nineveh and with about, I think, five to eight words uh, caused a whole nation to turn because the anointing of God was upon him. Now, June 13th, 2023, during this Pride Month on Tuesday, which I think was June 15th. I think it was two days. Yes. So think about this one. Think about this one for a minute. The day of the eclipse, okay, of Nineveh. The day of the eclipse near Nineveh, right before they had to repent, was June 15th. Trump was due in court on June 15th, 2023, to answer a 37-count indictment that alleges he will fully retain classified documents after he left office and refused to return them, which they found, I, it, you know, to me, that is just, you know, a lot of that is ridiculousness. But the date that eclipse happened on the 15th of June, they had him in court on this indictment on the 15th of June. This is no coincidence. June is the sixth month on our calendar. It is also the number of man and involved in the revelation that the number 666, three sixes, which would equal 18, would be associated with the man of sin, which involves the spirit of lawlessness and the spirit of Antichrist. Interestingly enough, the 18th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Zadik. It starts with a T. The T is silent. Zadik. Now, the interpretation, because it says one interpretation of this, because there is there is a what it says is there's a yud on top of the letter nun. Remember, we spoke about the letter nun earlier. So one interpretation of the nun is that it stands for Ona I, which is deceit and fraud. Who is the Antichrist? He is a deceitful fraud. So that is no coincidence either. And I thought I would I would throw that in. This then is the problem for the skeptic. The lunar eclipse, especially with the unusual darkening that only occurs in those places on the globe that observe it at sunset, did not happen at an arbitrary time, even an arbitrary time in the earthly ministry of the Son of God. It happened on the day that Christianity has always maintained was the most important day in the history of the world since creation, the day on which the Lamb of God died for the sins of mankind at Calvary. The resurrection three days later was God's sign that Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, 
was who he claimed to be, the Messiah, whose suffering and death were for our sake. After which he would rise from the dead, appear to many, and ascend back to heaven to victoriously sit at the right hand of the Father and take his rightful place as our mediator before the throne of God. So there is a problem for the skeptic because these eclipses happen during or close to history-changing events on the earth, events that change history, they are happening. So it happened with Herod. It happened with Jonah. It happened with when Jesus hung on the cross for three hours, darkness came. I'm so glad he put it up. The eclipse would have been seen. Now back to the Nineveh, okay? So this is from June 15th, 1763 BC. The eclipse would have been seen as total in the area between the blue lines. The site of ancient Nineveh is about four miles northeast of the center of the modern city of Mosul, Iraq. The province of Nineveh occupied a considerably larger territory. If this NASA reconstruction is correct, the eclipse would have been observed as only partial in the city, but a total view of it would be just a few miles further north. Here's the question. Could the Bur Sagali eclipse, which is what they call it, be part of the reason why Jonah, when he finally got to Nineveh, found a city that was serious about repentance? This has been suggested by various writers, and if true, it would suggest that Jonah's trip to Nineveh took place during the reign of Asher Dan III, who reigned from 773 to 755 BC. But the eclipse was not only the only calamity during Asher Dan's reign. There were different plagues, um, and there was a revolt, in there, and there was another plague that happened during the reign of this particular king. The usefulness of astronomy not astrology, but astronomy in determining the chron uh, chronology or had, I'm trying to think how to say this word now, like it's chronological. So it would be chronology of the two important New Testament events is now on solid ground. The first of these is the date of Herod's death for which the lunar eclipse on the night after the, the uh, after the killing of Matthias and Judas plays a decisive role. So basically you have Herod's death you have Jonah and Nineveh, you have Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ, and what happened. And now we've got this full eclipse coming in 2024. So basically, we have some writing in here uh, that does some math to show you how the eclipse really happened um, near Herod's death. Uh, and so basically what's been agreed is that 1 BC is the date of Herod's death because he tried to kill Jesus. He tried to find him as a child and kill him before that. Um, and so basically uh, these more recent studies are consistent with the writings of the majority of early church fathers who dated Jesus's birth, which necessarily was before the death of Herod to sometime in either late 3 BC or early 2 BC because Jesus was about I think two years old when the wise men got there. So he would have been about two years old when Herod tried to kill him. He wasn't an infant. He was about two years old. Herod's death occurring in early 1 BC are therefore in agreement with the dates of the lunar eclipses and dates from the start of Passover in the years 5 to 1 BC, as calculated by modern astronomical methods. So there's a pattern here that we see with these eclipses and these major you know, historical events happening near them. Okay, now we're going to go back now to the one for uh, the eclipse that happened with Yeshua for a minute. For a minute, the day of AD 33 eclipse, Friday, April 3rd, must have been difficult for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The city was very crowded. Uh, there were Jewish people and newcomers to Israel that gathered from all areas of the land and from far countries for the celebration of Passover. For some, the day had started before dawn um, with a sort of mob-like scene before the Roman governor and before their own leaders in which they had been incited to demand the death of Jesus Christ in place of Barabbas, who had killed a Roman soldier, which was one of the highest offenses you could commit. We must realize that we were all, that's capitalized Barabbas, facing a death sentence and Yeshua took our place and our sentence. Mob hysteria can be emotionally taxing, but even more so when the emotions are being manipulated 
toward putting someone to death, which Satan himself was behind stirring up the crowds. Satan himself is behind stirring up a lot of the riots we see happen in this nation as well. One, uh, once the consent of Pilate was obtained, which he really didn't want to give, there followed the horrible scene of the crucifixion of Jesus and the two thieves. Um, Roman practice was to make it a very visible event as a warning against anyone else attempting the crimes for which the victims were being punished. To that end, Jesus and the two thieves, they were crucified by a public road outside the city wall with the charges against them displayed. Jesus has said the king of the Jews, and I believe it was written in two or three languages. The Passover in AD 33, intended as a time of rejoicing and thanksgiving over God's great deliverance in the past, had instead assumed an ominous and tragic nature, or what appeared as one, because Jesus was about to have a great victory. Gospel writers describe further disturbances. About noon, a darkness overtook the land that lasted three hours. Jesus's ministry on earth was three years. He was in the dark tomb for three days. We are not told whether it was caused by clouds or a dust storm, but at approximately 3 p.m., three hours of darkness, 3 p.m., 33, which is how old Jesus was when he died. So when the figure on the central cross died, there was an earthquake and the curtains of the Holy of Holies was torn in two, which must have had this significance because there was a Roman soldier, a centurion who was stationed near the cross of Jesus. And after witnessing all of these events and with more insight and awareness, probably than many of people in that city at that moment, he concluded very soberingly that the righteous man who had just died was truly the son of God. After witnessing the darkness, the earthquake, the tearing of the curtain, this centurion had an awareness to know that this was no normal event. Okay. Um, after the earthquake, there must have been a short period of relief from the troubling phenomenon of the, what had just been witnessed. The darkness lifted. The atmosphere started to clear up. The traumatizing sight outside the city wall came to an end um, as uh, three bodies were removed and buried. Soon there would be the appearance of the Passover moon because it was Passover. In the wisdom of God, the feast of Passover always took place in the middle of the lunar month, guaranteeing that it would be a full moon that those would see at night uh, for the festival. Everyone knew that the comforting sight of the rising full moon could be expected right around sunset. The Passover lamb had made a show and spectacle of Satan in the kingdom of darkness that Passover day at Calvary. So the eclipse took place before Passover. In our case in 2024, it is reversed because the eclipse will take place after Passover. And we'll get into that some more. Shortly after the sun set in the west, the moon rose in the east, and it was a dark red, I believe, uh, that Passover. I'm sorry, because I said it would take place after Passover. Actually, the eclipse is following the same suit. It is taking place 14 days before Passover. And if we look at this chart right here of the two X's on the United States of America, August 21st, 2017 was a full eclipse. April 8th, 2024 will be a full eclipse. Okay. That's the, oh yes, that's the other one. We're going to get to that one. That one is the Al uh, is the alpha, which we're going to get to, but we, I actually have in front of me that I'm looking at that is going to be on the notes. It's a map of the United States of America and it's an X. It looks like an X through the map. And so you have August 21st, 2017 and April 8th, 2024. So an X. So I'm just looking at these two eclipses right now, which make an X. We'll get to the alpha in a minute, but yes, if we're looking at the 2024 and the 2017, that's a better view of it. Uh, the X is the shape of the ancient Hebrew letter Tav. The Tav is the 22nd and final last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it means cross, sign, or covenant. Notice where the center of the X lands on the map. So if you look at the location of the heart of a major earthquake fault line, which is called New Madrid, which is an interesting name for a fault line. This fault has the highest hazard rating. The center target 
of the total eclipse X is the same location. And eclipse and the center of a potential earthquake coinciding. So you have the, right in the center, you have the eclipse coinciding with a fault line, basically, which I think is no coincidence. And then you have the X shape, which is Tav, which means cross sign or covenant. There is a total of seven years between August 2017 and April 2024. Seven. The number seven has shown up quite a bit since we have began this broadcast with this teaching. Remember, the seventh letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Zayin, which means crown or weapon or to sustain. So in a sentence, if we put those three in, the crown, almighty God, utilizes weapons, the weapons of our warfare, which are not capital carnal, but mighty God through the pull, mighty through God to the pulling down and destruction of strongholds to sustain America, strengthen or support physically or mentally. That's what it means. To sustain America, strengthen or support physically or mentally through this time so it does not completely fall. So if you look at crown, weapon, sustain, I'm going to read it for you again. The crown, almighty God, utilizes weapons, weapons of our warfare that are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down and destruction of strongholds to sustain America, strengthen or support physically or mentally through this time so it does not completely fall. I think that is incredible because the Lord is the only one right now that is sustaining this nation from completely, completely falling. Joel chapter two, verse 10 says before them, the earthquakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark and the stars lose their brightness. There is another interesting connection with regard to the timing of these two total eclipses over America. The eclipse of 2024, which I'm going to focus on for a minute falls during a Hebrew calendar leap year. Now I learned this from Jonah. It falls during a Hebrew calendar leap year in the leap month of Adar 2, which is the month of March on our calendar. Purim occurs March 23rd and 24th of 2024. The Hebrew calendar adjusts for a 360 day annual cycle with a leap year because the sum of 12 lunar months is about 11 days shorter than the solar year. So it's about 11 days shorter, I believe, than our calendar that we follow. A 13th month is periodically added to keep the calendar in step with the astronomical seasons. A leap year in the Jewish calendar has 13 months and occurs seven times in a 19 year cycle. There is the number seven again. 13 months, seven times in a 19 year cycle. In Hebrew, a leap year is referred to as a Shana Miyubarech or pregnant year. It's referred to a leap year as a pregnant year. In a Jewish leap year, an extra month is added after the month of Shavat, which is January to February, and before the month of Adar, which is March. It is called Adar Bet, Adar Shani, or simply Adar 2. Let's say Adar 2 for a minute. There's something significant about it. There's something special about it. There is actually what is called a Pesach Shani or a second Passover during that leap year. The next eclipse happens on the 29th of Adar 2 right between Purim and Passover of the leap year 5784. So this eclipse literally occurs between Purim and Passover of 2024. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 21, it says, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He grants wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who know understanding. Some people still wonder, if Trump was a sign appointed by God. So this has been debated amongst ultra uh, Orthodox Jews, evangelical Christians, conservative Americans, you know, and I wouldn't say, I would say more he was anointed for an appointed time, I would say. That's how I would say it. Um, especially they have, uh, you know, continued the, to kind of debate this question. So isn't it interesting and profound that there was a total eclipse in the year Trump took office of 2017, because he took office in January of 2017. There was a, there was a total eclipse that year in August, eight months later, which is the number of new beginnings. 
Trump took office in January to release, which is more widely known as the sabbatical year. The next Shemitah falls in the Jewish year 5789, which begins on September 20th, 2028. It takes seven Shemitahs for a Jubilee year. So to give you an idea of events that happened on Shemitah years, uh, 2008 was a, uh, a Shemitah year when we had the banking crisis and collapse. So Shemitah years tend to coincide with major events happening. Rosh Hashanah 2028 begins on Wednesday, September 20th, 2028, and ends Friday, September 22nd, 2028. The next Shemitah year begins exactly in sync with Rosh Hashanah in 2028, the Feast of Trumpets. There is one more notable eclipse during this seven-year time frame. It's not a total eclipse, so the one in 2017 and 2024 are going to be total eclipses. The third eclipse runs north-south rather than east-west in what is called an annual eclipse. That eclipse will happen on Shabbat, which is Friday, October 14th, 2023, the 29th of the month of Tishri, or October. Yom Kippur begins that then uh, the evening of Sunday, September 24th, 2023, and ends Monday, September 25th, 2023. The 10 days of awe or the 10 days of repentance are observed during the time between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Now, if you overlay the annual eclipse with the other two total eclipses, so if you take 2017, right, and you take 2023, and you overlay it with the 2024 eclipse, and we actually have a picture of that. You see, you have the total eclipse of 2017, and you have the one of the partial of 2023, and then you have going across the one of 2024. It creates the shape of the ancient letter Aleph, which is symbolic of God. Aleph represents the oneness of God, and there it is. That is what Aleph looks like. It looks eerily similar to the chart of the eclipses, which is no mistake that these things are coming into alignment and happening. Aleph represents the oneness of God. The letter can be seen as being composed of an upper yud and a lower yud, and a bob leaning on a diagonal. The upper yud represents the hidden and an ineffable aspects of God, while the lower yud represents God's revelation and presence in the world or ineffable, ineffable aspects of God. This is not a coincidence. A also represents alpha for the Lord is the alpha and omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last who sits on the highest throne and judges the nations righteously and carries out justice, carries out justice. Aleph is literally going across our nation. By the time the 2024 eclipse happens, I find that no coincidence and it shows me God is moving. It shows me there are signs in the heavens and there are things aligning and happening that are showing an incredible move of God. Now, let's go back to the month of June for a minute. Um, but we're going to briefly talk about Jonah and Nahum in order to do it. Now, why am I bringing Nahum into this? The book of Nahum. Well, you'll see because they both prophesied against Nineveh. Much of what is written about Nineveh, I type this so fast. I type this so fast that I have spelling errors. Much of what is written about Nineveh, we see happening in the United States of America. When Jonah goes to Nineveh to preach repentance, the amazing thing is that Nineveh does repent, much to Jonah's annoyance. Now, remember, an eclipse happened near Nineveh's repentance. That generation is completely spared the wrath of God and lives, so to speak. When this happens, Jonah was incredibly annoyed with God and he made no qualms about it that he had spared Nineveh. It isn't for another 150 years, which would equal the time between now and the American Civil War, that Nahum is writing. He is foretelling the doom of Nineveh in order to encourage southern Israel from prematurely surrendering to Assyria. Interestingly enough, the Assyrians' main god they worshipped was Asher. A bull frequently appears in old Assyrian seals, appearing to be worshipped, suggesting that the bull was either the symbol of Asher or was Asher himself. Who else appears as the bull? Baal. Where do we have a very pronounced bull in America? The New York Stock Exchange. 
The later parts of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles tells the stories of Hezekiah and Josiah set in this time period. And the constant question is whether Israel should rely on God or trust in some bigger foreign power like Egypt or Assyria, the two big players in the region. Imagine, for example, you're Belgium before World War II. Do you rely on God or make peace with either Germany or France? And you're, and you're beginning to get the picture. As it happens, Egypt itself had fallen shortly before Nahum, and Assyria does fall very shortly after. Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The oracle concerning Nineveh, which is the capital city of Assyria, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord avenges and he is full of wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He dries up all the rivers, illustrating his judgment. That's in parentheses. Bashan on the east and Mount Carmel on the west wither. And in the north, that's in parentheses, the blossoms of Lebanon fade. Interestingly enough, the Euphrates River has been drying up for years. But why? Some of the many reasons why are, are you have you have dams, droughts, water policies, misuse. Um, and there are other reasons because it talks about the Lord drying up the rivers. Many fa- It also talks about this in Revelation. Many families in Iraq that rely on the rivers are desperate now for water. Uh, and the number one reason that the Euphrates River is drying up is low rainfall. What happened in the time of Ahab? and Jezebel. No rainfall. Everything dried up. The river has three riparian countries, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. Just an interesting look of what Nahum says from the Lord and what is happening now. I thought I'd put that in there. Back to Nahum, chapter one, verse nine, whatever plot You Assyrians, that's in parentheses, devise against the Lord. He will make a complete end of it. Affliction. And then it says affliction of God's people by the hand of Assyria will not occur twice. Affliction will not occur twice. Will not occur two times in a row. Nahum chapter 1 verses 13 through 14. Now I will break his yoke. And in parentheses it says of taxation. What is going on in this nation right now? What are they trying to do? Now, behold, I will break his yoke of taxation off you, and I will tear off your shackles. Verse 14, the Lord has given a command concerning you, O king of Nineveh. Your name will no longer be perpetuated. I will cut off the carved idols and cast images from the temple of your gods. And one of them was Ishtar. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile and unworthy. Ezekiel chapter 32 verse 22 is referenced here actually as a reference and it says Assyria is there with all her warriors their graves are all around her all of them are slain fallen by the sword so it's interesting how Nahum and Ezekiel cross-reference about what would become of Assyria Nahum chapter 2 verse 3 the shields of his soldiers of Media and Babylon are colored red the warriors are dressed in scarlet Media and Babylon, and the color red. So media, M-E-D-I-A, and Babylon are involved in greatly defying Almighty God and trying to destroy his nation and people. This is no coincidence. And media had the Medes. Darius, whom Daniel served, was a Mede. Who is trying to deceive the people right now and destroy the foundation of this nation? The media is being utilized as a conduit for those who have given themselves over to that spirit of Babylon. Another interesting idea to consider, what country's flags are almost all red? Um, You have China, Turkey, Canada, Morocco, and North Korea. That spirit that influenced Assyria and Bahrain as well, uh, that spirit that influenced Assyria, Media, which is Persia, and Babylon to do what they attempted to due to the people of God is the same spirit at work in many of these nations right now. 
Many of these nations have their hands in destroying, manipulating, rerouting, redirecting the United States of America and even Israel. Nahum chapter 2, verse 11. Where is the den of lions? Now, he's calling Assyria the den of lions. Remember, I had referenced the den of lions at the beginning of this broadcast and the feeding place of young lions, where the lion, lioness, and lion's cub prowled with nothing to fear. The lion of Assyria tore enough for his cubs, killed enough prey for his lioness, and filled his lairs with prey and his dens with torn flesh. Nahum chapter 3, verse 1, Woe, which means judgment is coming, to the city of blood, guilty of murder and mayhem, completely full of lies and pillage. Her prey never departs alive. Now, this is interesting. This is how Nahum is depicting this. This is what he's hearing from the Lord. This is what he's writing. Nahum chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. All because of the many acts of prostitution of Nineveh, the prostitute, the charming and well-favored one, the mistress of sorceries who betrays nations by her acts of prostitution in parentheses, idolatry and families by her sorceries. What are they trying to do right now? What are they trying to do? All of these agendas have become mistress of sorceries to betray nations, to betray families to lure families with their sorceries. That's exactly what's happening in this country right now. And the Lord says, behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will lift up your skirts over your face, and I will let the nations look at your nakedness, O Nineveh, and the kingdoms at your disgrace. I will throw filth on you and make you vile and treat you with contempt and set you up as a spectacle. And it will come about that all who see you will shrink back and run from you and say, Nineveh is completely ruined. Who will grieve for her? Where will I seek comfort, comforters for you? This is very strong language here. This is direct at the leadership of Nineveh and what Nineveh is doing to the people of God, what Assyria is doing to the people of God, the idolatry, the sorceries, okay, the murder of the innocent. The the deceit, the everything that he's talking about that was going on there, we see right now happening in this nation. Nahum uh, chapter three, verse 13. Behold, your people are as weak and helpless women in your midst. The gates of your land are open wide to your enemies. Listen to this. The gates of your land are open wide to your enemies. What is happening at the borders right now? The gates of our land are open wide to our enemies. Who are doing it? The leadership that want to engage in sorceries, in taxation, in idolatry, and in deceit. They have opened up the gates for these demonic forces wide to our enemies. Fire consumes the bars across your gates is what it says. Nahum chapter 3, verse 16. You have increased your traitors more than the visible stars of heaven. The creeping locust strips and destroys and then flies away. The top three traitors with the U.S. right now. Canada, Mexico, and China. Just think about that and how they're all involved. Canada, Mexico, China. Nahum chapter 3. We're continuing chapter 3, verses 18 through 19. Your shepherds, your leaders are asleep. What do they call Joe Biden? Sleepy Joe. What is one of his names? Sleepy Joe. Your shepherds are asleep, O king of Assyria. Your nobles are lying down. Your people are scattered on the mountains and there is no one to gather them. There is no relief and healing for your hurt. Your wound is incurable. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. For on whom has your unceasing evil not come continually? On whom has your ceasing evil not come continually? Now, I'm going to mention this. I know this keeps falling off of me. I'm going to mention, and I'm going to to talk about it with you next week. But this thing of cocaine being found at the White House just out in the open. I will say that a heavy, heavy drug like that, that is trafficked across the border, that is brought across the border by mules, 
will make someone very sleepy, out of it and confused, suddenly very awake and alert when taken. Because that is exactly what this drug does. And it's horrible for you. It's absolutely horrible. It's just something to think about. Um, I will tell you too, um, Barbara had mentioned to me, and she's praying about this, about something coming up with a fatal drug overdose of someone close potentially to the leadership in the White House. Um, so we're still praying about that, but that would be the groundwork being laid and the potential test run happening, uh, what was found, basically. Um, however, for anything like this to potentially occur, I would think that the covering of, of the leader has to be removed first, who is attached to that person. Just something to think about, just something I'm looking at as I see this going forth. Um, as Nahum is saying, your shepherds are asleep. Um, it's just an interesting concept that this was found in the middle of all of this, but we're still praying about that. So I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to go into that further. I will probably discuss that or go into that a bit next week. Now I'm going to tell you what's happening. No matter how bad it looks, God is on the throne and these people still need prayer for them. There is a speed bump on the front. There is a speed bump on the front. <laughs> 